Florida has always been a popular tourist destination, known for its gorgeous sandy beaches and subtropical climate. But there is a Florida you may not know. A Florida just as beautiful. A Florida some have dedicated their lives to protecting. A natural Florida where ancient ridges gather water that flows into its rivers. Wide open prairies with working cattle ranches. This is the Florida that tourists don't see. But now, that Florida has become the third most populated state in the U.S. with nearly 1,000 people moving there each day. What's at stake for its natural lands? So obviously a, a thousand people moving to a state is a tremendous amount of pressure. It's pressure in lots of ways. It's pressure on the land because people need somewhere to live. It's pressure on the water because people need clean water. It's pressure on natural resources because people love to recreate in natural Florida. But there's a flip side to that. One is people come to Florida because of the natural beauty of Florida. So there's some incentives for us to keep it a beautiful place. Nobody ever came to Florida to visit a subdivision. Quite seriously, they came to Florida to visit our beaches or to canoe down our springs or go to one of our sort of more touristy areas. And we as a state rely on being a healthy place. Florida, you know, over the last several decades has just exploded. I can't speak for the entire state, um, but I can speak more for this part of the state, um, which is in southwest Florida, down in the Naples area. You know, if you're here in the early 80s, this was still a small town. And over the last you know, 30, 40 years, it's just boomed. And you, know, you look go along the coast and you're going to see massive developments and mansions and big buildings and condo buildings that are just everywhere. People are gonna keep coming here because it's beautiful. And so I think the real challenge is figuring out how we can accommodate the people that come in a way that doesn't damage the thing that makes this an attractive place to come. So these are Florida's ridges. If you were in South America, they would be the Andes. If you were in the West Coast, it would be the Rockies. In Florida, these are the sandy ridges that represent a kind of spine that runs through the middle of Florida. Go downhill from there and you're in the big, open, wide prairies, many of which are working cattle ranches, hence ridge to ranch. The 10,300-acre Buck Island Ranch is home to the MacArthur Agroecology Research Center. Archbold acquired the ranch in 1988 and this was really different for Archbold because it is a very different ecosystem than the Florida scrub. So it gave Archbold the ability to expand its research onto ranch lands. Ranch lands are really important in Florida because they're one sixth of the state of Florida. And we use the ranch as a living laboratory to understand how cattle ranching impacts the environment and also what are the conservation values of ranch land. Established in 1941 by Richard Archbald, Archbald Biological Station is a research institute in Highlands County, Florida. So here at Archbald Biological Station, one of the things we look at is biodiversity and natural systems. And the biodiversity and natural systems is something people have always been interested in but whenever they try and study it, they run up against something which is biodiversity itself. It's so huge. So this is one of the places where, because we're an independent station, we've been able to like watch this for a long time. I guess as a scientist, you know, we're always sort of questioning the world, questioning what we see, trying to come up with explanations for what we see and how the world works. We see the world as like interconnected. Every, everything affects something else. And it's important to us to see those connections and every little part makes up a bigger whole. And if you affect one thing, it can affect something elsewhere. There are a ton of people researching in this area, the intersection between human management 
and then also rare plants. And in Florida, there are a ton of rare plants to study that on. And I'm very interested to see how we can help manage areas so that rare plants continue to exist. Rare species, especially in this part of the world, are really important because they're, for one, they're threatened by development. And um, we need to make sure that we protect the biodiversity that we have and that we, that we still do have. So it's really important to understand who's pollinating these kinds of species, how that is working for the plants, how important pollination is for the plants, and it'll help us understand how we can better preserve the plants. The conservation was not the original goal of the station. So the goal of the station was just to do science. And gradually it was borne upon us that in a way this would be a very selfish thing to do because we would be studying things that we might be the last generation of scientists that would be able to study them. Most of the natural habitats around here were disappearing at an incredible rate. So eventually we decided we had to actually work on conservation. We started projects dealing with endangered species and endangered habitats. And we actually went out and found some areas that we thought should be protected and work with agencies to get them protected. So we were actually fairly active in all this. If you're a scientist and you work in natural systems, you very likely will know of Archville Biological Station. But if we ask folks in Florida, they've very rarely heard of us. You have a sort of very spiritual and deep connection to Florida here, a place that's, you know, sort of full of knowledge and information and understanding, a place that's sort of whose history spans back nearly eight decades, a place that has really helped us understand what has happened to Florida what could happen to Florida, and probably furthermore, how we can better manage things so Florida will be a better place in the future than it would be without Archbold. We're starting to understand better than we probably ever did how connected we are in, in landscapes. Water's important in every place on the planet for, for all living things, and it's a great physical reality and metaphor for the connectedness we have. So on our landscape, you can track that water from the ridge to the ranch, to the river, to the reef. And what happens upstream from me impacts me, and what I do here impacts everybody that's downstream from me. And so this sense that we should be able to do whatever we want with the land that we own is just wrong. You know, it's wrong in a community where we're connected, it's wrong ecologically. We have to guide the things we do on the landscape that take into account that interconnectedness. We're in a very important watershed. We're in the headwaters to the Everglades, so all the water from these ranch lands flow down into Lake Okeechobee and eventually into the Everglades or the estuaries. We are connected to the Everglades. Uh, believe it or not, the Caloosahatchee is one of the outlets of the three. The Caloosahatchee River is connected to Lake Okeechobee, which is part of the Everglades. North of Lake Okeechobee is also part of the Everglades all the way up to Orlando. So any rain that falls, any runoff that goes into the Kissimmee and into the lake can end up out the Caloosahatchee, out our river. There are three outlets from north of the lake to the lake. Most of the water used to flow south and that water now is too polluted to flow south. They've engineered it so that it will flow east and west from the lake to St. Lucie Estuary and to the Caloosahatchee. In addition, we have water that falls within the Caloosahatchee River on the west side of Lake Okeechobee, and all that runoff comes to the Caloosahatchee as well. So we have the addition of 30% more water coming into our watershed than it ever historically had. We are transitioning from a seagrass-dominated ecosystem, which is a low-nutrient highlight environment, to one that's murky, that has a lot more nutrients and favors macroalgae, which is overgrowing the seagrass and, and causing a fundamental change in the ecosystem. And until the Everglades restoration projects are completed, and it may take 50 years and $15 billion, but what we have is a river with unusually high and unusually low discharges. 
and that feeds right into our open bays. And, and in those bays are our oyster reefs. And oyster reefs are an incredibly important part of this ecosystem. In a 2016 four-part series published in the Naples Daily News, Ryan Mills and Eric Stotz investigated Florida's shrinking shores. In flat Florida, a one-foot sea level rise could send water inland as much as a mile. The series basically looked at the state's investment into its beaches. And what we found is that beaches generate billions of dollars in economic revenue for the state every year. Every year the state gives just a fraction of that, sometimes as little as a penny per dollar that it takes in from taxes to renourish those beaches and to, to build them back up. We found that you know, one of the things that they've done is uh, allowed kind of extensive building along the coast, and that building is done on beaches that are critically eroded. And one of the things we found is that it's very rare for a permit that is requested to be denied. And even on beaches that have been deemed by the state to be critically eroded, but if you work hard enough and you push hard enough, you'll get your permit. One approach might be more up and less out. You know, if you need to take a piece of land and put a certain number of people on there, you can give each one of them a house and a lawn and spread them out really wide and have a big impact. Or we could all come to accept that, is it, wouldn't it be great if we just had a nice apartment and then we all shared this huge chunk of undeveloped land around us? Many people coming to Florida, they've never been anywhere as ecologically different as Florida. You know, they've come, they've come from up north, they don't understand that our forests actually regularly burn and need to burn to stay healthy and this is a good thing if fire is managed properly. They don't understand the tremendous vulnerability of our wetlands to excess nutrients. So protecting a lot of uh, natural lands managing those natural lands so they have the right amount of water and the right amount of fire and the right amount of changes that they experience is important. I think one very powerful approach that Florida is using, Southwest Florida is using, is setting aside chunks of the land to not be developed. And there's a lot of debate about how much do you need. Florida faces many challenges, from its growing population and expanding development to its infrastructure and its water. And so one of the challenges here in Florida is getting the water right, as we like to say. So making sure that the water that comes down our rivers into our estuaries is clean and provides a good environment for all this wildlife and for fish to thrive. Because without good water quality, you don't have the lifeblood of a healthy ecosystem. The wildlife needs to move. And if you don't connect those protected areas, then over time, the species will become isolated and could, you know, eventually go extinct. Without these large green spaces, the water that Florida has a lot of would ultimately run off that much faster, not get into the water table, not recharge our aquifers. Green spaces like this allow us here in Florida to live as comfortably as we do. One sixth of the state of Florida is ranch land. Um, so if Ranchers are pressured to convert to more intensive land uses like row crops or urbanization, then it will be a huge biodiversity loss in Florida. The future of unprotected lands is certainly something to be concerned about. There's a lot of people moving into Florida and they need a place to live. And so there's going to be you know, greater and greater uh, pressure for development and that's going to be a challenge. I think not taking open space for granted is important. Just, you know, think, sometimes we don't realize the value of something until it's gone. I really think the most interesting challenge and maybe hopeful solution is that the places we're going to develop, we should look hard at the nature of that development. Obviously, you've got issues with sea level rise. You've got issues with development that aren't going to go away. One of the things we kind of found when we did this article and we talked about the, the permits that were allowed on the beach was that Florida's kind of all in when it comes to development. I showed you a map of 2060, and that uh, map is where will development occur in Florida if we keep on using the same decision-making that we've used in the past. 
So if we keep on building along roads and leapfrogging ahead into the sort of rural parts of Florida, we can very successfully uh, basically destroy our state. The challenges are significant, but with the support of its citizens and elected officials, the treasures that make Florida beautiful and unique can be restored. And for some, the path chosen lies in science, education, and conservation. This idea that you're contributing to knowledge, you're moving things forward, and you're helping, you're helping make the world a better place. That makes it a very rewarding thing to do, not just for yourself, but for, for those around you as well. So we study science here, and as a rule, instead of following the money, as it were, we go out and ask the environment to tell us what's important. It's really easy to kind of live separately and not think too much about what's going on with the plants or where your house was built or you know where the roads that we drive on were built. But um, whether we like it or not, we have a huge impact on the land that we're living on and it has a huge impact on us. And so finding that balance as a society and as a community, that's incredibly important. I think scientists in the future are gonna play an increasing role in that. I hope we'll have trained another generation of students to go out and be ambassadors for science and conservation. Um, I'd like to fondly hope that people will know us a little bit better in 10 years time. So one can always hope that, you know, our message will have gone a little bit broader and wider as well. I think people recognize that the work's not done. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And, and so that gives me hope that, you know, people care. And even though there's very high, almost insurmountable obstacles sometimes, the will is there. And I think eventually, you know, we'll get there. Another hopeful step that I see is that we both understand the responsibility that we have and we are increasing our knowledge um, to be able to use that knowledge in positive ways rather than in negative ways. People are gonna keep coming here. So we need to focus our energy on what we can do and what we can do better rather than worrying about things that are inevitable. Hello there. Looking nothing.
Ha, 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 ha.